do reverence God and thank him for our being here this evening and thanking him for another opportunity uh, to study his word and to draw closer to him by getting a better understanding of his word. This study now takes us to a covenant with God. Uh, this is lesson one uh, of four lessons that deal with uh, the different covenants uh, with God. A covenant is an agreement. The better word, I think, is contract. Um, the other word for covenant that you know is testament. New Testament, Old Testament can be called Old Covenant, New Covenant. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it, and, and, and the uh, great thing about the covenant with God is most of the time we don't bring nothing to the table. Mm -hmm. Except he asks us to believe and obey. You ought to think about that. But most covenant uh, uh, contracts, you have um, equal partners, or at least each partner brings something to the table uh, that binds uh, the covenant and the relationship. But uh, the, the different covenants throughout Scripture, uh, there, uh, of course, the dynamic, the, the first covenant with Adam, about him tilling the soil and not eating of the tree, of course, Adam broke that covenant. And now we have the Noahic covenant, which has to do primarily uh, with the promise of no more destruction of the earth and its inhabitants uh, with water. Amen. Uh, and, and one thing the writer points out, which is very clear, the Lord does not promise there won't be no more flooding. Amen. He didn't promise there would, no be, there would be no more deluges from flooding. But he said he will not destroy all flesh, nor men from uh, the destruction of rain and water. Because we're looking right now at the situation in Houston. Seems like a very, very great deluge over four feet of water. Uh, I think it's at about 51.88 inches uh, right now in some of the most devastated areas. But, but here's the issue, or here is the thing. Uh, it's going in, the full total destruction. Amen. People are surviving. There are some people who won't, but, but, but there are some that are uh, going to survive. So uh, this book of Genesis, um, which was written according to our historical uh, teachings by Moses, now, I know the obvious question is, how can Moses have written Genesis when it predated him? Well, I believe it is that God revealed it to him. During the 40 days he was up on the mountain with God, uh, God revealed to him not only creation story, but the uh, great deluge, the, the Noahic uh, story, and all that surrounded it, and he also kind of pointed out to him why he did it. Uh, but after God did it, he realized that uh, that really wasn't the way to straighten folks out. <laughs> Amen. You just leave a few of them alive, and guess what? One but eight left, and they had trouble with them. <laughs> so so uh, that, that wasn't really uh, the way to keep them alive. Um, I mean, to destroy or to straighten man out. So we embark upon this study tonight uh, of Noah and his covenant with God. We're going to look at uh, first Noah's worship, and we're going to look at God's promise, and then we're going to look at uh, the rainbow, the That's bow what I to add. that confirms uh, the promise uh, of God. So if, if you want to ask now, you can wait till I get to it, up to you. No, I'll wait. Okay. Uh, the lesson opens up uh, in uh, this study with Noah's worship of God. Now, 
we even sang the song, it rained 40 days and 40 nights without stopping. I don't know if y'all remember singing that song, but that used to be a popular song. Didn't uh, it rain children? Yeah, didn't it rain children? Yes, it oh, rained. Didn't it rain. But, but uh, uh, in, in reality, uh, how long did it rain? 40 days. Okay. It rained longer. Uh, 40 days was enough to flood the earth and then it rained longer. Okay. No, it wasn't raining all that time. Uh, uh, but but I, I think when you when when you check, uh, you're going to find out that it probably rained about 150 days. But the 40 days was uh, what it took to cover the earth, and then it kept on raining. Uh, when you look in the in the lesson background, it sort of gives you. Uh, some of the information of the length. Uh, let, me, let me just read the biblical account of the great flood is but one of the least five ancient flood stories. The existence of the latter leads some to believe that the biblical account used them as sources and that the flood is a legendary myth of an ancient and ignorant people. But if there truly was a great flood in ancient times, then stories of the event would be passed down from generation to generation. And of course, if people spread, then the story could possibly uh, uh, change. But, but the truth is that the flood did come and did happen because all scripture is true. Now that's what we believe. Uh, uh, the, the, the story of how long they were in the ark even after it had rained for the period of time. It took over a year for the ground, uh, it appears to be habitable again. Um, and that's in Genesis chapter 7, uh, verse 11, and then 8, 14. It talks about, about the floor waters covering the earth. Uh, the biblical account of the great flood is detailed and giving specifics from the beginning of the flood, the length of time the rain fell, how long the flood waters covered the earth, how long it took for the waters to recede, and the total amount of time adds up, as we've already said, to a little more uh, than a year. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, and, uh, and, and we'll look farther into it, because if you go into the scriptures, that's where I heard how long it, it took. Um, you'll find that the rain continued for an extended period of time. But let, let, let's just deal with, with what happens. The, the rain is over. Uh, the raven has been sent out. The dove has been sent out. Uh, the dove comes back. His feet had not touched ground. And then Noah sent him out again. And when he comes back this time, he's got an olive leaf in his mouth, which means that trees and everything have been exposed again, and, uh, and, and, and so the connection between uh, Noah and the earth uh, is being, can I say, it's being restored, because uh, just to imagine, uh, well, there are a lot of things you can imagine, uh, like how it smelled on that ark for a year. <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, but just to imagine not seeing dry ground for over a year. That could be devastating in itself. So what is the first thing Noah does after he comes out of the ark? Well, let's deal with the scripture here. <laughs> Verse 20. <laughs> it says that he became a husband man, but the first thing he did, he built an altar. Now, just as a point of reference, this is the first time the word altar is used in the Bible. Now, I know we go back to chapter 4, and Cain and Abel offered up sacrifice, but there's no mention of an altar. And they both act, offered up sacrifice unto God, of course, 
Cain's was rejected and Abel's was accepted, um, and not because necessarily of the sacrifice itself, though it was uh, because of sacrifice, but it was because of the person who made sacrifice. He offered God his best, and he did it from his heart. And the Lord said to Cain, if you do right, you be accepted. Amen. So, so, so here is the first time that an altar is mentioned. Verse 20, read please. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. All right, so he took of every clean beast, and every clean fowl, amen, um, and offered, and made an offering of, up to God. Now, it is it's possible, it's extremely possible, and I believe it's probable that during that one year voyage, there was some new clean beast born. Because if he didn't have but two and he offered up one of them, then how could he replenish? Well, yes, he sir. took seven clean seven beasts. No, no, seven clean birds. Seven clean beasts. Seven clean, two unclean. Right, seven clean, two unclean. What? Beast. That was of every clean animal, he took seven. Every clean, seven. Okay. And two of all the others. Two of all the others, yeah. All right, two of all the other beasts. All right, and it's believed that he took seven because, or he took more clean because he knew he was going to make sacrifice unto God. And he had to eat some probably. Okay. Well, they weren't eating meat then. Well, that's true. Yeah. Officially. That's true. The permission to eat meat came later. Yes, ma'am. I want this to sound intelligent now. <laughs> Reverend, how long does it take for a body to disintegrate in water? Because when there have been dead bodies, what happened to the people that were on earth? I mean, they drowned. Mm -hmm. What happened to their bodies? They <laughs> became, they, they disseminated. Well, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, so there were well, no bodies after no year. No. Oh. There are no bodies. Okay. Bone, but they didn't sink. Okay. And the fish certainly didn't drown. If That's correct. Fish. I'm sorry, what did you say? If there were fish, fish didn't, they didn't, didn't drown, drown. Oh. And, and it's possible some of them got ate up. Right, because the fish was eating them probably. Oh, okay. okay. And water has a tendency to wash flesh away mm -hmm. off the bone. That is correct. That is correct. What did you say, Ms. Robinson? Water has a tendency, <laughs> to I'm sorry, to wash flesh away. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And so all of that leads to the disintegration okay. uh, of the flesh. Mm -hmm. um, Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll go back into this. Uh, verse 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not make, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the emanation, imagination. imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite anymore any more everything living as I have done. All right, so God had destroyed everything except um, Noah, his wife, and uh, his eight, his eight, total of eight, his three boys and three their three wives. Mm -hmm. And God said after he received that sacrifice uh, from Noah mm -hmm. that uh, it became to him a sweet uh, smelling savor, amen, uh, and, and enjoyed. In other words, it was a worship that he enjoyed and appreciated, and he says to them, uh, I'm not going to do this again to humankind nor to the animal world. This I'm not going to do. And, and, and it was an affirmation, too, of his receiving uh, Noah's sacrifice. Now, one of the things that's talked about here, just, just for information, is that we talk about God uh, uh, smelling, we talk about God's hands, we talk about God's feet, we talk about God's eyes, and he walks with me, and he, he talks with me. Now, those terminologies uh, really are, are man characteristics, and the word is anthropomorphic. And anthropomorphism is the attributing to God uh, physical attributes 
that only belong to man. God is a spirit. Amen. But why are these terminologies used? It's to help us to understand the correlation between God's uh, response the way we understand it. We, we could not understand it if it was presented only in a spiritual realm because it transcends our understanding. Remember, we are finite and we're dealing with the infinite. And so when it talks about God smelling, uh, it, it, it mainly has to do with God showing the attribute of receiving. Uh, when he talk about God walk it, and talking, it talks about God's presence. Are you, you all following what I'm saying? Yes, uh, and we attribute these abilities uh, to God, um, and that attribution to God is called anthropomorphic, uh, an anthropomorphism, which is um, uh, us putting human traits on God. So, you know, when, even when we say he's too big, you can't go around him, and he's too high, you can't go over him, and he's too low, none of these fit God because God is everywhere at the same time. So there's no length and no breadth and no height and no depth that measures God. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. I'm trying to uh, uh, explain. Uh, so, so God says that that curse that I inflicted on man, uh, I'm not going to do that again. And not only on man, but he also brings the animals in. Some, uh, one writer said that some means that God equates animals uh, uh, almost to the level of man. That's not so. And that doesn't even imply that. Because if he equated animals with man, why would he say it's all right to eat animals? He don't. Animals are in a different category. But God is saying that the destruction I brought not only destroyed men, it destroyed animals also. And so uh, he is not, his promise is he won't do it um, again. And because God said that, what does verse 22 say? Earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not see. Amen. There is an order that God set at the beginning of time. And God is saying, though it's been disrupted this one year, amen, because couldn't be no seed time and harvest when everything's underwater, right? Nowhere. Nowhere. But even now, what God is saying is, it's not going to cease like that anymore. Even though it may be too cold here, they're going to be somewhere else that's going to be warm, and there's going to be seed time and harvest going on. And the other things that I put in place initially when I started the earth, that is the promise. That, But listen at the promise. While the earth remaineth. I don't know if anybody heard that. Amen. Which does tell me the possibility <laughs> that it may not make it because it won't be water but fire next time. Amen. And that is scripture. All right. But, but he says that he's not going to take these things away and that the earth will operate on a continual cycle and continue to do and be what it should be and, and it's going to uh, be working right. So now uh, we've got Noah worshiping. Now look at God's promise. And we're going to, uh, in Genesis 9, 1 through 7, uh, God's instruction for Noah and his family to increase the population. Humanity is to multiply anew over the face of the earth, hand in hand with the instruction is a covenant that God expresses between himself and the earth. So that brings us to verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. Amen. Now here is the covenant. I establish it with Noah. I establish it with his sons. And I establish it with the future generations, all of your seeds. Uh, this is my covenant 
uh, with you that uh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to give you a sign uh, that's going to let you know that I keep my word. I'm going to keep my word that said I would not destroy the earth again like this. Verse 10. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Amen. So it not only is extended to Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, or should I say uh, Japheth, Shem, Ham. Mm -hmm. uh, Ham was the youngest. Mm -hmm. uh, but to all the beasts, to all the animals, to everything that came out of the ark, mm -hmm. they're going to be the recipients of this covenant. Amen. The covenant is with you, but they are going to be the recipients of the covenant. Amen. Do you know your blessings can, can uh, be affected by who you with? Yes, sir. Yes. Amen. So even though the promise is not to them, the the animals necessarily is going to be extended to them. So what if you don't destroy the earth? It automatically bless all the inhabitants of the earth. All right, y'all. Well, Question? Yes. That's why I want to make a point. That's why your parents wouldn't let you go around all different type of people. My mother used to always say, you're not going around those people because they're up to no good. And when they get caught, and, and really, those four people that killed got killed out there in North County, that 18-year-old boy, one of the boys was just visiting. Mm -hmm. You heard about that last week. Sure. But when people shoot up folks, they shoot up everybody in the house. Sure. And there are animals in heaven. Is that not correct? No. I ain't read that nowhere. <laughs> Reverend didn't I ask you that one time? Yeah, and I think I told you that. <laughs> <laughs> In Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah says 11. what? Huh? Isaiah 11 talks about animals. In heaven? That's right. One time I thought he lamb? told me there were animals. Hey, heaven. lions will lay down the lamb on the earth. On earth. Oh, okay, yeah. Because okay. right. right. heaven is going to come to earth. Right. Okay. I have no record personally. I wish I could find that scripture in Isaiah because I'd like to read it. But of animals, uh, uh, then you're saying animals have souls. Oh, they are living souls. They are living beings. What other than man has the capacity to authentically worship God? What other than man was made in the image of God? I'm just asking the question. Amen. And we're not going to really get into that because we do have more scriptures to cover. But, but now, you ask, if you ask me, I don't believe personally, and I know a lot of people probably watching this that love their dog and love their cat and all that, think they're going to be up in heaven. But I have not seen that in scripture. I have not seen it. I'm not saying it's not there. But I have not seen that in scripture, uh, nor uh, do any references. Now, if you want to call uh, seraphims and cherubims and the, and the creatures, living creatures, if you want to call them animals, uh, but they really are not. They are created beings for praise and the worship of God. All right? So uh, don't nobody be offended by it, but all you got to do is find the scripture. And uh, if you're here, you can tell me. And if you're, if you're listening to this, uh, via YouTube, you can write me, uh, send it to me. But uh, uh, but uh, okay, that, that's <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say about that. But all that go out of the ark uh, and uh, beneath the earth, and uh, maybe there's a special covenant or relationship with them. But I know this: in order to go to heaven, you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you have to obey the word and the teachings of God. Now maybe there's a secret society of animals that's going on that I don't know about. And I'm claiming right now I don't know everything. Amen. And so, uh, uh, all right. Anybody want to come in on? I'm open. I, I just, um, I just want to mention the the animals are more perceptive to God's word, and they are they usually do what they're supposed to do more so than man. You know what I'm saying? They are. I hear what you're saying. I just don't agree well, with you. Well, I don't mean that they're there. I'm just saying. No, I hear what you're saying. I just don't agree with you. Because I don't believe, you know, the pit bulls are vicious animals. Not all of them, but so many of them are. Well, and I don't think it's the plan like of God for them to bite their owners. No, well, we got some wrong. We got some wrong. We got some wrong. We got some wrong. All I can say is that uh, God obviously has blessed animals with a certain yeah. instinct. Uh, uh, of survival uh, uh, beyond that as far as species, I don't know because I'm not a, a four-legged animal, but I say that on, if nothing else on the premises of a golden retriever that grabbed his dog food in Texas and went to, went to share it with it. So. Well, now, 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 I'm not denying instincts and the abilities and everything, but in the image of God, yeah, in the image okay. of God, amen. And salvation, Jesus came to save man. Yes. Yes. Now maybe animals have done no wrong where they need saving, I don't know. But I disagree about animals being obedient and all of that uh, because really uh, it is the plant world that is really the one part that carries out and does what it's supposed to do. The plant world? Yeah. Okay. Apples buy, bear apples. Peaches bear peaches. Hello. They are obedient. Amen. He's looking for the scripture. Verse 11. And I, and I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by waters of blood. All right. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by what the waters of a flood. Amen. Some flesh. My heart goes out to Houston. And here's I heard something today that hurt me, I guess, more than anything. And I mean, the devastation is terrible. The death of things is terrible. But, but listen to this. One out of five people, one out of five homeowners has federal flood insurance. One out of five. One out of five. So 80% of the people who lost their homes have no insurance. Because your insurance does not include flood insurance unless you live in a flood, a flood plain where they force you to purchase it. Well, they don't force you, but yeah. Because the truth is, if you don't live in a flood plain, they give you the devil trying to buy flood insurance. I'm talking about the feds. It's a challenge to get it. But again, not all flesh is going to be cut off by a flood. And we've seen floods and we've seen tsunamis and we've seen other methods and things that were deadly, haven't we? Yes, sir. But not all flesh was cut off. It's terrible that in Africa, over 200 people died in a village from a mudslide mm -hmm. that they know of. They don't really know how many died. Mm -hmm. That's sad, that's devastating. But God's promise is that not all flesh is going to be cut off. Verse. Uh, uh, yes, B. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. All right. Not only, not all people, but the earth. Now, uh, whether there was ever a worldwide deluge, I don't know. But I do know they said they found seashells at the top of Mount Everest. Right. Mm -hmm. So, 
That's a very good sign that at some point uh, that part of the world was underwater. That's the highest mountain. That's correct. Right now. Right. Because, you know, there can be shifts mm -hmm. in the earth which could make other mountains uh, as high or higher. All right. So, uh, so God says to them, here's my covenant. Man, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Ham, and your families, I'm not going to do this destruction again. Here's my covenant to all of the beasts, everybody that came out of the ark. I'm not going to do this to the earth again. And then I'm going to give you a sign of confirmation that I'm not going to do this again. And that's verse 12. God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. For perpetual generations. Ongoing. Amen. The covenant won't stop because you gone. And I'm glad I got a God that is not bound by time so he can do what he promised. Amen. No matter. <laughs> a lot of people make promises and they die before they carry it out. But we got a God who can make sure that whatever promise he makes, both positive and corrective, <laughs> or negative is not a bad word, uh, God can carry out his promise. Um, read on. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Amen. I set my bow. I set my bow in the clouds. And, 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 and here's the thing about the bow or the rainbow is that it only appears after the storm. Sometimes you used to get a glimpse of one maybe during the storm because normally during the storm the sun is not out. And it takes the sun to reveal the rainbow. And it can be taken beyond that. But the sun reveals to us. But it says that it's bow because it's shaped like a bow. An archer's bow. And here's what right, it, right in our lesson says, and, and, it, and I thought it sounded good. I don't, I don't know how much sense. He said, God laid down his weapon of destruction against the earth. And when we see the bow, we are reminded it don't have an error in it. But it is God's agreement. Now, I know most of y'all heard, if you get to the end of a rainbow, you're going to find a pot of gold. And there we were, <laughs> as children, <laughs> racing across the field to try to get to the end of the rainbow. Amen. But uh, most of the time, when you get to the end of the rainbow, you can't see it. Huh? Well, you just can't. I mean, because the light and the, the what creates the rainbow, of course, the sunlight passing through the water crystals. That's what creates uh, uh, the rainbow. And there are other things like particles and dust particles and all that stuff that can affect the color of the rainbow. There, there's a lot that goes into it. But people can say where it came from, where it didn't come from. I believe the word of God. I believe it is God's reminder. Somebody says, uh, uh, and, and I think it's raised in this lesson, uh, why would God need a rainbow to remind him? God don't need nothing. It's for us. It's for us. It's to remind us that he remembers his covenant. Amen. And people can make covenants all the day, all, all, all they want, but they, if it's not remembered, it's of no value. Verse 14. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. All right, read on. And I will remember my covenant, which I 
which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Amen. God says that when I see the bow, it shall remind me. But the truth is that the bow really is to remind us of the covenant of God. That, does that make sense to anybody? I mean, I, yes. I, I, I don't want to be, you know, I want y'all to shake your head yes, and you really believe what God said there. He said he's going to remember it, so he will remember. But in reality, uh, he remembers his covenant. Amen. And he's God. So we have to believe that he does not uh, really need a reminder from us. <laughs> Verse 16, yes. I'm always in awe of a really beautiful rainbow. Oh, it's like God's yeah. majesty. It is. You know, you just stand and look at it, and you're like, yeah. I mean, and some are really spectacular, you know. And you just stand and look and think, now this God's work. Yeah. Some of the greatest ones I've seen uh, were in Hawaii. Really? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And sometime it would be around one of those out of the mountain waterfalls. Mm. You see the water coming out of the mountain, a waterfall, and a great big old rainbow wrapped around it. Uh, it it's, it's just, it's, it's all inspiring. Uh, and, and even though it's beautiful, and, and the beauty probably has something to do with it, it's purposeful. Mm. Yes. It's purposeful. It's covenant oriented. It's a promise kept when God reveals the rainbow. Verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is a token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. This is the token. This is the expression. Mm -hmm. This is what helps me to realize and help you to realize that I will keep my covenant and I will keep my promises unto you. So, uh, God made a promise to Noah and he kept it. And he's kept it, and uh, we, 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 can, we can say that it's been probably, uh, according to Archbishop Ursha, the earth is probably 6,500 years old. I mean, I know science is saying it's millions and all of that, but according to Archbishop Ursha, who is a historian who, who says how old, uh, based on the calculations of the life of all the patriarchs and the life of Adam and all of them. This is what he had calculated the earth to be. And, and, and uh, if we add to that uh, almost 1,500 years before Noah came on the scene uh, and, and, and the 900 plus years that Noah lived, uh, this covenant has existed uh, for over 4,500 years or 5,000 years. And guess what? A lot of people have come and gone. But God's covenant is still, still standing. God's promise is still standing. And we can believe and trust God for his promise. Yes? Uh, I just want to add that uh, as you were uh, expounding that God remembers his covenant. Uh, this is a true uh, uh, in relation to man. However, man has to be taught what the rainbow even symbolizes. That is correct. And it's up to us to pass it on to our children. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we do. <laughs> but we do or not. But, but we have to be taught. We don't come into the world expounding on, oh, that's a rainbow, and it means. That's correct. And all some people see is the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that it's more beautiful than they even know. Because the great beauty is God's covenant. Are there questions? And uh, hopefully one day we'll resolve the question of our dogs and cats in heaven. That's what I, it's I know you were trying to find. Did you hear? I did. Where is it? Just what I said. It's Isaiah 11 chapter. It's, well, we it's got time. Where it comes. I, I, I ate these verses up pretty quick tonight. 
the stem of GSA and talks about uh, come with the girdle of righteousness, which is uh, Jesus Christ coming to earth uh -huh. where it boils down to heaven on earth. Eleven chapter what? Oh, Isaiah. okay. Heaven on earth. Yes. Heaven on earth. Okay. Okay. Right, right. <laughs> We've already said everything. All right. Line laid down with the, lamb. Down with the lamb. Right. Yeah. yeah, but it's not up. It's not in heaven. We've had that. It's, it's, it's the new so Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Not in the third heaven. It's it's the new Jerusalem. Right. Right. Yep, because he's talking about going to his mountain in Jerusalem. All right. Right. All right. All right. So we we on the same. Amen. All right, y'all. <laughs> I didn't really want to get up there in the streets of gold and have to run from no pit bulls. <laughs> They're going to be tagged. But isn't there, isn't there something in They're going to have rubber teeth. They're going to have rubber teeth. Amen. And there's something in uh, when he gives the uh, the laws about the dietary laws, uh -huh. about eating and about partaking of blood of the animals. Oh yeah, that, that's right here uh, in in Noah. I mean, part of what he does, teach Noah, uh, and it's not in our lesson, but he teaches them that you are to eat no meat with blood in it. Because the life is in the blood. And that's why some people, and especially uh, ancient times, believe that if you ate a man's heart, you took on his life. And if he's strong, you took on his strength. Now that's what they believe. But the Lord commanded that no blood uh, is to be uh, eaten uh, in the flesh. So it's drained, that's part of the kosher pro process, uh, the karuth, uh, which is what the actual procedure of uh, 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 law is uh, for the cleansing of uh, the animals, but it is said that we are not to partake. Amen. So I, I, amen. I don't like no bloody steak. That's me personally. Amen. But different people, you know, different choices. But I'm gonna, amen. I'm gonna stick with the Bible and said, uh, make it well or me. <laughs> yes. Okay. Do you believe Noah's Ark is on that mountain top? Over Mount Ararat. But the government won't let us in there to go up there and check it. Well, well it's a I'm going to say this to you. 4,000 years old, made of wood. <clears throat> could be petrified. 4,000 years old, made of wood. It could be petrified. <laughs> <laughs> let me just say this to you. There's no salvation in Noah's Ark for us. No, that's true. No. <laughs> Jesus is our ark. Okay, man. Okay. That's where our salvation is. Do I believe that it landed on Mount Ararat 100%? Yes. Okay. But you know why I believe it? Because Not because the government found it. Because it's in here. Oh, okay. And the Bible says, and the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. That's why I believe it. <laughs> now, whether... A 4,000 year old ark is up there or not, I doubt it very seriously. Amen. I'm not here to challenge about petrified. I've seen petrified forests and all of that and what happens where wood actually changes to stone. Amen. And there's a petrified forest that you can go to and visit and, and literally see wood that has been changed and they don't, I don't think they totally know why it happened. Amen. And uh, just like they don't, they never figure out how the Egyptians could make your skin turn to leather. Mummification. The mummification process, where literally when they took the mask off, and I'm going to say this, then I'm going to give it back to our superintendent. Uh, when they unearthed Mega Evers, they had unearthed her, his face looked almost like it did when he was buried. It has, its flesh had almost leather, become like leather. Yeah, I saw that. And it was in, I think, Jet Magazine. But uh, I'm saying to you, that is a mystery that the Egyptians, or the ancient Egyptians, uh, kept and have not shared. Anything else? Any other questions?
All right, and thank you, and thank you, Brother Collins. Hey, Amen. You didn't have to buy those books. I think that's wonderful that you decided to do that and show your appreciation to all of the teachers. Hey, Amen. And uh, I applaud you. Amen. 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 You did say you paid for them. Right? Oh, okay. <laughs> and they want to be applauded for the wrong. <laughs> it's not a gift. <laughs>